Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. On behalf of Pathfinder International, I welcome you all to this webinar, Towards Universal Health Coverage, Accelerating Progress for a Healthier Future for All, in commemoration of this year's Universal Health Coverage Day. The goal of universal health coverage is to ensure that everyone is able to obtain the health services they need without suffering financial hardship. But it's also about ensuring quality and accessibility of health services for everyone where they live. Every year across Africa, the lack of access to basic health care, mostly caused by lack of investments in systems building, contributes to inadequate systems and inadequate um, assessment by many in the healthcare system. A key element of universal health coverage includes financial protection from the cost of all health and, excuse me, ill health and access to and use of needed health services that's within reach. This makes the government's health expenditures critical to the achievement of the objectives of universal health coverage. Health and well-being are critical components of good governance and as such, reflect prominently in the value of universal access to healthcare. Health is important for the well-being of a society. Countries cannot grow economically if they have a sick population. Investments in health are not just the right thing to do, but they make good economic sense. So how do we get to UHC? You start by building and enhancing primary healthcare systems and services. Services for youth, seniors, maternal care, disease prevention, and you can and, sh and should offer integrated services in a manner that are close to the communities they serve. This builds trust and reduces costs, not about those who just for, for those who deliver the services, but for those who need access to it. Key component of the health system are health workers, and they're needed at every level. They need to be paid, supported, and resourced. Community health workers are a critical component of the health workforce, and they ensure that the most vulnerable have equitable access to health services. In many low and middle income countries, we saw that community, during COVID, how many community health workers were on the front line for COVID care and treatment. Investments in community health systems and CHWs mean that communities are better equipped to respond to health emergencies, promote healthier populations, detect, prevent, and control threats to health care, leaning toward what we're looking, all looking for, universal access to health care. Integrating comprehensive family planning services into existing networks of trusted community health workers can address major barriers to reproductive health services, including reducing fear, social opposition, and misinformation. Such integration can also increase agency, equity, and bolster sustainable growth. A healthier future for all starts in the community, and communities truly are at the heart of the UHC movement. Pathfinder International's commitment to universal health coverage is instilled in our vision. Pathfinder envisions a world where everyone, even in the most challenging of environments, has, has what they need to be healthy, thrive, and live the life they choose. At Pathfinder, we're proud to partner with governments in advancing universal health coverage through country health plans that integrate sexual and reproductive health care in community and health system strengthening. They mobilize stakeholders within and beyond the health sector and advocate for resource allocation for health systems. As we prepare for the 2023 high-level meeting on universal health coverage, we call on governments around the world to take bold steps forward toward achieving the lofty goal of universal health coverage by 2030 and develop UHC plans that account for sexual and reproductive health and rights needs for women and their family. Thank you all for joining us here today. And with that, I am proud to turn the mic over to Dr. Mabratu, who is a senior advisor to the Minister of Health for the Federal Ministry of Health in Ethiopia to give us a keynote address. Dr. Mabratu. Thank you so much, uh, Crystal. Thank you for the fond uh, introduction. So, uh, good afternoon and good uh, evening, uh, and a good afternoon for some of us in different horizons of the world. I, I my greeting for 
their participants and also the speakers. I thank the organizers for the invitation uh, as it's happening in the time when the world is evolving in devastating pandemic and the conflict. The theme of this year's UHC Day celebration is the theme uh, so special as we discuss in how to build the world. And I am very glad to make a remark representing one of a very pioneer nation in global health, Ethiopia. So with 120 million population inhabits in the home of all African nations as a capital of Africa, we want the world more safer. All families have a privilege of quality healthcare and the prosperity that all people can access uh, quality health service without financial hardship. The revised advocacy uh, on the UHC is so special for developing countries like Ethiopia, who are overwhelmed by the profound social, economic, political burdens. And in Ethiopia, the pandemic together with conflict, as you know, drought, which has happened in Horn of Africa never uh, before, and the, the political burdens due to this uh, unrest uh, founded with the flooding deserts and the locusts uh, treating to revise, revert the gains of the past two decades and halt our progress towards to uh, SDG and the UHC. In Ethiopia, with partnering with development partners like Pathfinder, we work to ensure that all Ethiopians realize to have those all UHC aspirations in a long history of partnering with the government. We introduced a 10 year plan very recently, uh, just a year back, and uh, this uh, renewed uh, 10 year strategy uh, shows us in the major three pillars. Uh, the first one is including the development of an equitable, equitable and accessible standard of health service, assurance of accessibility of healthcare for all, the provision of healthcare for the people on the scheme of payment with special assistance mechanisms, which for example, we have a community-based health insurance and social insurance under making. So it's meant to be the alternative for user fees to access equitable healthcare without financial hardship. With the current coverage of 44% of informal sectors, uh, our CBHI becomes a mandatory by law this year. Primary healthcare service has also been delivered free of charge and or exempted to all service users irrespective of their income level for equitable, promotive, preventive, curative and rehabilitative service to the people. So multiple sources finance Ethiopian healthcare sector as a developing country, the proportion of health financing from domestic uh, sources are almost up, with exclusion of the donors have increased from 53% in 2008 to 83% of 2021. The per capita health expenditure reached USD uh, 33 in uh, 2020, which is merely 4.5 in 1995. Imagine how much we moved, but the amount is still a meager compared with the World Health Organization recommendation per capita, you know, for developing countries is low, low behind the target. Ethiopia health spending consists of 5.8% of uh, GDP in the last decade, which in Abuja declaration, we agreed to increase more, but still we are lagging behind. Total expenditure, health expenditure is increasing still, but it remains low, especially for in the primary health care and uh, we have still we have a high out of pocket which is 34 percent currently the health sector has vision of achieving uhc through phc for the past 25 years the system is led by every five year revolving strategic plan which improved health access through the massive expansion of primary health care units and our flagship health extension program which is known in the world which led us to decrease maternal mortality from 871 by 2000. Now, in, in very recent measures, we had 4.1, even though it is still unacceptably high comparing with uh, the other uh, countries. We have still a very low caesarean section rate, which is one of the indicators for comprehensive emergency care. Under five mortality rate, it was decreased very significantly due to the vaccination and other activities we had done for under five, but still it's, it's, it should be moved to down. Neonatal mortality, however, is still not moved that much. 
So through this after reduction in the child malnutrition, the problem is still significant. Stunting is affecting one out of three children with huge geographic variations. Non-communicable diseases are increasing, and in as you know, globally and in, in developing countries, especially the triple burden of epidemiologic transition from communicable disease, non-communicable diseases, and the emergencies are happening. So as a country, we are aiming in HSTP2, our uh, health sector transformation plan, uh, which is launched a year back, as I said, we are aiming to increase our life expectancy from 65.5 to 68 per, per individual. Then uh, we want to decrease maternal mortality rate, as I said, from 401 to 279 life births. Under five mortality is intended to decrease to 244. It's currently our round 59. And also premature mortality is still significant. It should be reduced. So we are aiming to increase our contraceptive prevalence rate from 41% to 50% in this five year. Also, we are aiming to increase our cap per capita health expenditure from 30 USD to 42 by end of this five year. So we are trying to decrease the out-of-pocket share to 25%, and we are trying to enroll uh, the, the CBHI to 80% of the informal sectors, which are differently affected by, by, by the catastrophic out-of-pocket expenditure. Social insurance should be rolled in very near future. We are aiming to July, and increasing health worker density, as, as Crystal, you mentioned, is one of our priority areas. Currently, we have uh, one per 1,000 population, so we are aiming to double it in these five years. We already doubled in the last 10 years, and we want to augment this. So to safeguard the population, as uh, it is already mentioned earlier, and to treat the balance of the pandemics, the emergencies, and the essential service, we are trying to mobilize locally from domestic citizens, government funding increment to for allocation, and also this mobilization is tied with every level of the community, including the federal to the local level. So the community is contributing by cash, by kind, and also they are sharing even their meal for those which are disadvantaged and visiting the community health uh, services. So this is one of the innovation we had as a country. Also, we had uh, in-kind contribution for the facilities to be renovated, the infrastructures to be built by the local community and also the local private citizens. Even though the country is a big population with multi-ethnic group, when the eight, 18 languages speak, we are trying to, to really work hard when with this high global inflation, unemployment, conflict, climate change around our horizon. Excellencies uh, and participants, just ongoing disruption in health systems for women, children, babies, and are immensely affected for the services. So the need is increasing every day, and we work more to safeguard the people's health. As WHO released, so 90% of developing countries are experiencing a big disruption due to those current issues. So childhood vaccination, family planning, nutrition, safe birthing services, these all are affected by uh, many factors, as I mentioned earlier. So the long-term investment, as Crystal, you mentioned, are very much important, especially in post-pandemic mitigation, preparedness for the future uh, of the world, and the building the resilient health systems and the revisioning uh, uh, public primary health care requires increased spending in improving community engagement and empowerment. In production of adequate, skilled, motivated, and health workforce, which is already affected by devastating the pandemic and improving data systems along with a strong management of disaster and the surveillance systems. So we want also to emphasize that the private engagement is a cornerstone. Really, we realized uh, if we wanted to, to re realize the UHC. We need to design interventions that reduce the equity gap by prioritizing, prioritizing the use, refugee, IDP, by expanding engagement of implementing partners, TSOs, and all actors. Hence, there is an urgent need for solidarity among the international community to increase developmental financing. That means the official development assistance targets and to use the development effectively, 
aid should also be used efficiently using the principles of global solidarity. That includes country alignment, harmonization, managing of the results, and that we are happy to engage more in coming advocacy agents in plan for this year. Government of Ethiopia also show ownership through building a strong public finance management system to improve transparency, accountability, and uh, that the aid resources are used efficiently, which we were support a lot by partners like Vice Funder. I hope and I believe today's meeting will deliberate in depth on the issues and uh, share valuable experiences globally and can help us ensure safeguarding people's health in the changing world. We are very thankful for the Vice Funders advocacy and the support for Ethiopian government in the longest of partnering and bringing quality healthcare service to millions of people in their need of it. So it's, it made the primary healthcare vision reality and the working to strengthen health infrastructure, train and mentor the health workforce, which are very much in despairable in, in, as we have seen the COVID and the, it helped us to ensure that all people get the care they need, including maternal, neonatal care, and screening of preventive services. My sincere appreciation to organizing team for this important timely meeting, and I'm at your disposal if you have any questions and suggestions for it to take. Thank you so much. Back to you, Kirsten. Hello, thank you, Dr. Mebrato. Uh, Bruce, could you please come uh, offline? Good morning, good afternoon, and, and good evening, colleagues. Let me just uh, say a huge um, thank you uh, to, to Dr. Mebrato. That was a, a, a brilliant keynote uh, address. and. We're so thankful to have that from the <clears throat> Ministry of Health in Ethiopia, who have indeed faced some very challenging times, and yet the impressive uh, uh, achievements that, that have been attained are, are, are remarkable. Um, very pleased to see you already laying out a path, identifying the challenges that still lay before you between now and 2030. <laughs> and of course, we as Pathfinder have been very, uh, very thankful to, to have worked so closely together with you over the past years. Today's um, we're, we're going to have um, six panelists from five different countries address us, and as we know, um, we're, we're going to focus on the fundamental um, pillars of, of universal health coverage and recognizing that universal health coverage really starts with a focus on equity, leaving no one behind, on trust, on building community engagement and trust, on the whole issue of healthy environments on sustained investments, and on, of course, holding governments accountable. UHC, as we know, requires strengthening health systems across the globe, ensuring equitable coverage through um, systems that provide high quality services in primary health care settings, and systems, of course, that put the most vulnerable first. UHC emphasizes not only what services are covered, but also how they are provided and whether or not clients are treated with dignity and respect they deserve. So today's panelists will touch on what's needed to build a healthier future. And um, as we, we, we will have six panelists and um, we're very, very pleased to, uh, to begin our uh, panel by inviting, if we can, Mr. Maboub Alam. He's the country director for Pathfinders operations in, in Bangladesh. We're gonna kick off uh, our discussions today on the issue of healthy environments. And as we know, climate change continues to threaten and undermine the achievement of UHC through negative health outcomes, as well as health systems disruptions around the world. And Bangladesh is, is no stranger to such disruptions. And so we're very fortunate to have Maboub with us today. Now Maboub. Drawing, and uh, yeah, if you can join us on the screen, drawing on your wealth of experience, our question for you is, can you tell us a few of the innovative health solutions that the government of Bangladesh has introduced to address the natural preparedness and response? We have, uh, we're running a little bit behind, but um, we're really looking forward to your, to, to your response to that specific question. Over to you, Mabu. 
Yeah, uh, thank you, Bruce. Uh, yeah, yes, uh, you have rightly mentioned Bangladesh is a country uh, where uh, disaster cyclone, disaster like cyclone flood are very common. And as far as universal health coverage is concerned, um, Bangladesh government is committed uh, to ensure universal health coverage for all. And uh, in this regard, uh, the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare has developed uh, a strong health service delivery network ranging from tertiary level to the community level. And uh, the facility level services are uh, supported by strong uh, community level uh, health service delivery network, including uh, domiciliary services. And uh, to ensure universal health coverage, government also identified essential service package that are uh, provided uh, across the health system network. And uh, the essential service cover uh, package includes uh, uh, reproductive health, maternal health, child health, newborn care, infectious disease control, non-communicable disease, capacity development of service providers and accessibility. So these are the components of essential service package. So as you can understand, the approach is very comprehensive in terms of uh, uh, providing basic healthcare services uh, across the nation. Unfortunately, this strong health service delivery network is not functional and has become disabled during disaster. Mm -hmm. Every year we see uh, in the disaster prone areas, uh, health service facilities are disconnected. And the population surrounding to those facilities do not get uh, required services from the facilities as uh, most of the facilities are inundated or, or destroyed or some kind of damaged uh, during disaster. And we also see and we also observe uh, those health service centers remain uh, non-functional for a substantial period of time. And the consequence is uh, the women and adolescents, they are the worst sufferer because uh, the emergency services like antenatal checkup, uh, delivery, safe delivery services, and menstrual health management related services are not uh, provided with uh, from uh, during uh, during the disaster. So now let me tell you what Pathfinder is doing uh, to address those things. Recently, Pathfinder. Uh, has introduced uh, women-led climate resilience program. So as part of that program, we are integrating uh, disaster management, uh, livelihood activities, and sexual and reproductive health services. So this is the first of its kind in Bangladesh, Pathfinder has uh, introduced. And uh, the beauty of this uh, project or the strength of this project is that at the community level, we have uh, identified women champions, champions from the adolescent girls who are at the leading, who are playing the leading role in terms of project implementation activities. Just I'm uh, uh, mentioning two innovative initiatives that we have been doing for the first time in Bangladesh. The first one is the facility assessment. We are assessing the facilities through disaster lens just to understand the preparedness status of the facilities in terms of service delivery during disaster and post-disaster situation. And our aim is to identify the required services that uh, we need to provide or, or the required support that we need to provide so that the facilities of the disaster areas are remain uh, functional. And, and the most important thing is that uh, the most of the solutions that we are expecting uh, are locally designed and locally resourced as a, what we are doing, we are just connecting the dots at the community level. And we are also facilitating the process so that uh, the local government representatives come up with ideas uh, to address those issues and, and with some resources uh, so that uh, the facilities uh, could have some support from them. We are also working with the adolescents at the school level, particularly with the adolescent girls at the schools. We are helping them to prepare for the next disaster. 
as I have mentioned at the beginning, the disaster is not uncommon in Bangladesh. But what is common is that the uh, the disaster situations, the sufferings of the people. Every year we see similar suffering, similar kind of situations. It means even though Bangladesh is highly regarded for successful disaster mitigation or disaster uh, response activities, but when it comes to the question of disaster preparedness, the situation is much less than the expected level. So as part of the the community uh, women-led climate resilience program what we are doing we are helping the women and adolescent girls at the community level so that they are well prepared to uh, cope up with the uh, disasters that we are expecting in the coming days so that's i will stop here uh, that's all from my end so i will respond if you have any question yeah, thank you over to you bruce oh thank you so very much and and it's it's uh, particularly impressive to see what you've been able to do, and 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 I, I was taken by your um, by the work that you're doing on the health facility assessment. I mean, the basis behind preparedness is making certain that we have a very good picture of what is the current situation on the ground and what will need to be done. And we'd love to follow uh, as as you go forward over uh, in the coming uh, in the coming years and and hear more about that particular intervention. We're going to shift now. Um, to the whole issue of adolescent and youth SRHR. And in the sexual and reproductive health and rights space, thought leaders from around the world have always observed that SRHR for young people is an essential component of universal health coverage. And some even argue that investments in adolescent and youth SRHR programming are, are one of the most cost-effective and impactful of all development investments. Yet, and as we know, adolescents and youth are frequently missing from these conversations. And when they are involved, it's often on the periphery. So thus, it, it's, it's, it's really, um, I think it's, it, it's, a, it's a real pleasure that we have with us today, Karine Udrago um, from Burkina Faso, who's the Executive Director of SOS Youth and Challenges. And she's gonna answer a question for us. Our question for her is, what steps did you take to ensure young people are now being involved in the development of national action plans for SRHR? Can you um, please uh, give us a little uh, response to that question? Over to you, Karine. Okay, déjà merci à mon merci. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for this presentation. I think it was very interesting. And thank you for Pathfinder for this initiative, for inviting me here. Thank you for, for giving me the chance of participating in this um, session for, for to share our experiences and to share um, all our challenges and, and, and highlight everything we did and all the, the measures and the steps that were taken. It's very useful and before everything, I, I will show you a presentation about SOS Youth and the Key. That is something that is, um, uh, um, it's, not, uh, it's, it's not related to politics. This is really independent. And we are focusing on sustainable and equitable services for young people and adolescents. And this is an initiative that was set up in 2002 in Burkina Faso. And we focus, we, we, we mainly focus on sexual health and rights uh, of adolescents and, and youth, family planning, universal health coverage, and the protection of children rights. And also I'm going to define the, the universal health coverage as we see it in Burkina Faso. Un individu face à des risques financiers de soins en cas de maladie ou de maternité. Sure to, 
universal health care means that the entire population has access to the health services that it needs with, with a high quality so that uh, they could benefit from high quality health services without having to pay a lot of money. So uh, we are uh, starting to operationalize the new system to help uh, especially poor people who uh, uh, now have been uh, registered and receive uh, health services on a regular uh, basis. And so for those people, there is no, uh, no um, outpatient uh, or inpatient uh, trust. And we want to be sure that young people are involved in developing the national uh, health uh, plans. We uh, uh, develop a system um, to uh, allow young uh, people association and women's association to be represented uh, in order to uh, have their say uh, when we develop uh, strategies. And those uh, people, uh, young people and, and women, have been talking to uh, members of uh, uh, health ministry, and uh, we have put uh, together a system that enables them to develop the system in all parts, uh, all regions of the uh, country. And uh, young people are very involved now. And uh, they even uh, take part in the uh, development and uh, writing of national plans. And there are uh, many uh, youth organizations which are represented and they work together in order to uh, develop uh, ideas and to support what is being implemented now. So there is a strong uh, uh, relation of collaboration uh, among all those people, and that's very positive. Regarding the challenges uh, and problems, uh, sometimes it is difficult to uh, involve young people in all parts of the country, and uh, if we are doing what we can to make sure that there, this is done on a structural level, and we want to be sure that uh, young people participate in all uh, aspects of the uh, development of uh, health plans on a national level and regional. But uh, sometimes we, in some areas, we don't have enough money. The health budget of the provinces is not uh, su sufficient. So we are, uh, we are doing what we can now to help um, uh, direct uh, funds to uh, family planning and uh, similar uh, things. Uh, this is, and we have an objective uh, by 2025, we want to reach our goal. Thank you, this is all I wanted to say. Well, thank you so very much, Karine. And as mm -hmm. always, it's uh, absolutely uh, wonderful to hear the voice of young people and to hear how structured um, your engagement has been, recognizing the constraints that you've you've outlined, as, as is often the case um, uh, in terms of sustained financing. But really, particularly uh, pleased to hear how strong the collaboration appears to be, and and how, as one organization, you work so <clears throat> closely with all other youth-led and youth-engaged uh, populations. I, I, I think this really is a core element that has been missing in an area that virtually um, uh, every country where we're, uh, we're attempting uh, to support universal health coverage needs to do more to ensure it's that young people are truly engaged. Now, we're gonna move ahead to the next um, panelist, if we can. It's uh, Dr. Aisha Rashid. She's our country director for Pathfinder in Pakistan. Um, and we're going to address the issue of equity. And, and, and once again, equity is another fundamental pillar of universal health care. And, and for health systems to work, they must work for everyone. And they must, um, no matter who they are, where they are, what the context is, or how much money they have, equitable health coverage puts really does put women, children, uh, adolescents and the most vulnerable first. And, and the whole concept of leaving no one behind 
and reaching the furthest behind first comes to bear. But sadly, and, and as we all know, it's, it's been observed that a number of UHC processes are, are, are gender blind. And there are seemingly endless examples of how disproportionately women and girls are negatively impacted by such things as the pandemic or, or the climate driven disasters and displacement to civil, civil war and unrest. So obviously there's, um, there's really much to be done and um, in order to ensure that gender equitable responses uh, are, are reflected in a truly intersectional gender responsive <clears throat> health systems approach. And so we're really pleased to have with us Dr. Rashid for this session. And our question for you, Dr. Rashid is, what programs and policies has the government of Pakistan um, put in place to address this? And how, how have partners such as Pathfinder been supporting these efforts? Over, over to you, Rashid. Thank you so much, Bruce, and thank you for to everyone for giving an opportunity for Pakistan to present as well as um, kind of talk about what we're doing in here. Pakistan, as you know, uh, just very briefly, I'm going to put a bit of a background on where we are at in Pakistan. We are uh, obviously a developing country. We face natural disasters and other crises in the in the past few years. This year, we had one of the worst floods in our history. Um, over the last hundred years that we've had, and which has deeply, deeply impacted uh, two of our major provinces, as well as a huge number of population that's been impacted by this. Um, so in terms of delivery, given all of these challenges, uh, the government here has uh, made an attempt to come up and respond to some of the challenges of service coverage and um, some of the uh, issues that outline uh, how to improve services for not only the general population, but particularly the world number population that include the women and girls and the other world number population that we have. In, in terms of uh, improving access during risky periods and risky times, the governor Pakistan here has, has introduced a Sehat Sahulat card or a health insurance scheme. And Sehat Sahulat card literally means health facility. And this is sort of an insurance that provides a basic package of services to all the population inside the country. It started off in our, one of our northern provinces, which was the Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, and then it has now also been introduced in our largest province, which is Punjab, by virtue of population. And will soon we're they were attempting to start and cover all of the countries over um, all of the Pakistan provinces over time. Given that aspect, I think there are still quite significant challenges. For instance, the Sehat Sahulat or the insurance card is uh, sort of gender neutral or gender blind in a sense. It doesn't target too extensively, particularly vulnerable populations. It uh, also is for all people in the province, whether you're rich or poor or where you can afford services or not. So those are some of the aspects and the challenges that are behind uh, this insurance scheme. While very laudable in improving universal health access coverage, there are still some challenges in terms of targeting to particularly vulnerable groups that are not receiving services. In that, um, so Pathfinder, in, in a sense, is helping the government of Pakistan realize this by working through its current programming. We have uh, partnered with the Gates Foundation as well as with USAID to deliver a project and programs that will seek to build capacity of government service to become more gender responsive, including you know, social behavioral communication strategies that address and seek to address the aspects of gender, particularly targeting women and girls. Working with outreach workers um, that address, uh, working with outreach workers such as the lady health workers and the community midwives so that we are able to uh, we are able to reach women and girls in vulnerable and hard to reach areas that they need the services of and improve both family planning, primary health care, as well as maternal and one child health and nutrition services. This is the kind of approach that we're doing. We've started off in SIN government most recently, and then we will be moving on into the KP government as well through our uh, Gates Foundation funding, we're working in Punjab as well. So those are some of the aspects that we're trying at this point in time. 
Natural disasters remain a key challenge for us uh, in terms of uh, reduced access for women, particularly reduced access for maternal newborn health services, as well as family planning, which suddenly create a lot of gap. Um, we therefore are working with government of Sin right now, which is one of the most affected provinces on you know, flood response and creating health system resilience within uh, within the government to respond in crisis situation and ensure that services continue. I think I'm gonna stop here because I know we are running short of time. I'm happy to take questions on our approach and our services and over to you, Bruce. Well, thank you very, very, very much, Dr. Rashid. And I think the whole world has had its eye on Pakistan over the over the last months and, and certainly our hearts go out to all those that, that that have felt the impact of, of this natural disaster. So obviously, I, I'm sure one of the questions that might come up in, in, in this quite impressive response that you've outlined is um, the issue of financial sustainability. And um, maybe you could, uh, when it comes time to Q&A, uh, tell us a little bit about how you would see the contributions that government is making now continue after those investments you've mentioned from Gates and USAID and others. So we'll come back to that in, in, in a minute. But it does uh, provide a, a perfect segue for our, our next uh, presenter, um, Dr. Jose Arono, who's, um, who's joining us from uh, Kigali at the moment. He's multitasking and several, uh, uh, on several different fronts. Dr. Arono is the co-founder and managing partner of ENK Consulting. And it's an advisory investment firm providing turnkey solutions to healthcare and finance and technology sectors in Africa. So on the issue, this fundamental issue of sustained investment for universal health coverage, we're, we're looking to you to um, answer this question. What health financing reforms, I mean, really structural reforms can countries put in place to accelerate progress towards achieving UHC by 2030? I mean, our dream would be that we, <laughs> we finally get to a stage where we no longer hear that, that financing really is one of the chief impediments of, of, of universal health coverage. Dr. Rono, over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Bruce. And um, uh, nice to connect with all of you uh, around the world um, on this important topic. I'm dialing in from Kigali. We are here for the uh, Conference on Public Health. And um, just to reassure you that uh, financing is also featuring quite prominently in the discussions here. Um, so to your question, Bruce, about um, how, do we, how do we get to sustainable financing for, for UHC? And your question is about what structural reforms are required. So I think um, there are a couple of um, a couple of points. So when we talk about you know financing for universal health coverage, I think the outlook that we need to adopt, and especially you know speaking to you know government entities that are collecting tax funds, is to look at universal health coverage as as a human right to health. So it's not um, a luxury that should be provided as an afterthought, but should be like a core part of um, what governments provide for the citizens uh, in their countries. Um, just the same way governments uh, provide for you know, military protection for their countries. Um, I think governments understand that a lot more than they do in terms of protection against disease and maintaining people in good health. So that, that's the, the, the major outlook. And then if we to come technically into the health financing domains, um, the work we've done at TNK Consulting Firm is, you know, we tend to think about it in terms of the health financing arrangement. And this is to say, how do you organize health financing in any one country for optimal universal health coverage um, attainment? So the health financing arrangement has three components. There's a part on revenue collection, a part on risk pooling and then a part on strategic purchasing and i'll talk about the strategic the systemic changes we need to make in each of them so on the revenue collection side um, there are many approaches to collect revenue for universal health coverage but i think what has been you know shown repeatedly to be sustainable is to have you know a non-voluntary contributory mechanism that gives citizens um, access to quality health care without the need for co-payment at the time of seeking healthcare. So this in many countries would be most efficiently done through you know, government-led um, tax mechanisms. 
which is to say that you know just the same way countries are collecting taxes um, from their revenue authorities, they should use that for for help. And why is this uh, critical? Um, it's one of the most efficient ways to collect money. Attempts to do you know like voluntary contributory mechanisms. Um, even in my home country in Kenya, you find that for every ten dollars you're collecting, you probably need three or four dollars to collect the ten dollars. So it's not very efficient. So this for universal coverage, the government-led mechanisms are quite strategic. In many countries, um, the bottleneck is that the, the people in the, in the formal employment represent a very small part of the population. So that small part tends to be overtaxed and governments need to not tax that group more, but to widen the tax bracket. And that has taken the form of, you know, you know, revenue tax for small and middle income countries, uh, businesses for digital uh, businesses that are running on digital platform so that you you widen the net to have a lot more people contributing and you know contributing small amounts rather than having few people contributing large amounts that may not be sustainable so that's that's a key one on the revenue collection but of course that mechanism can be augmented by more innovative um, revenue collection mechanisms we've been fortunate to you know to structure financing mechanisms for, for cancer care in Kenya and in Ghana. And these ones have been leveraging on mobile money and the fact that as you use your mobile phones, you, you earn you know, credit points from the technical company that is providing your services. And people are willing to, to trade that for insurance premiums, for instance, for specific disease areas. So in a, in a place like in several African countries where mobile uptake is quite strong, um, that becomes a, another mechanism that has been proven to work. And from our own work, we've been able to leverage on that, uh, working with Safaricom in Kenya and MTN in Ghana to say that, okay, your customers are accumulating um, credit points uh, or royalty points throughout the year. Can they use that as premiums for, for, for healthcare? So um, that's for revenue collection. When it comes to risk pooling, um, in many countries, um, the, the largest risk pools are again government entities, uh, whether at national or more devolved settings, and national health insurance funds, um, as well as uh, national procurement mechanisms for medicine. So, you know, in Kenya, we have the Kenya Medical uh, Supplies Agency with the National Health Insurance Fund. In Ghana, we have the National Health um, Insurance uh, Service. And this represents, you know, one of the largest um, pools of uh, risk pooling. And I think the idea, the structural reform is to try not fragment those risk pools and aggregate them. So um, rather than have, you know, a separate risk pool for civil servants that is separate from the rest of the population, the idea would be how do we get a harmonized risk pool that is large enough where the risk for specific diseases is then spread across the, um, uh, the population. But then um, I think where the, the structural reforms become really, really good or uh, necessary is when we look at the purchasing function. So the last function within the health financing arrangement. Uh, and here, um, I want to distinguish between passive purchasing for health and strategic purchasing. On the passive purchasing is what tends to happen in many countries where the the payers, um, insurance companies, um, government agencies are paying health providers for procedures and products without any reference to health outcomes. So you're paying a hospital for doing an x-ray or a mammogram or for giving out an antibiotic, but there's no visibility on whether that payment is really tied to a desired health outcome. The downside with that is that it creates perverse incentives in the health system where as a healthcare provider, you incentivize really to provide more services and more products and more procedures and not necessarily improve health outcomes. Um, so we need to move away from that passive uh, purchasing to go into strategic purchasing, which is where uh, the payment is tied to health outcomes and the payment is to incentivize efforts towards improving health outcomes. This is quite clear in countries that have um, health management organizations organizations that are contracted, again, it's very clear outcomes. So for instance, in breast cancer, um, and I'm speaking on breast cancer because it's where we've worked quite a bit, you have healthcare centers that are providing treatment for breast cancer, 
commit to a certain outcome certainty. Um, clinical trial data suggests that with the current recommended treatment, you should get about 80 to 90 percent positive outcome for early stage breast cancer. So the, the insurance companies will contact healthcare providers against that threshold and say, okay, we'll reimburse you, uh, not for just doing a mammogram or putting a patient on chemotherapy, but we'll reimburse you based on how well you reach this 80 to 90% threshold. If you reach it, you get you know, reimbursed in full, you get reimbursed promptly. If you don't reach it, then your reimbursement is penalized by a certain amount. So what that does is that it creates a structural shift in healthcare delivery towards quality of care. So if I'm a hospital, it's not just going to do mammograms and put patients on chemotherapy. I'm going to look at my treatment protocol and how does it how it gets me to the 90% treatment certainty. And that is that is a way you're using the revenue um, to incentivize the right behavior among um, healthcare providers. And that is really critical on the strategic purchasing part. It's difficult to get there because it calls for a health technology assessment, which is data driven. So that means we need to have a way that health outcomes are routinely collected and they feed back to the payers. So if you're a national health insurance fund, you have visibility on, okay, I paid for, for um, treatment for cancer for cancer for a thousand patients, how many of those attained remission within a certain period of time? And that is, is really critical so that we, don't, we move away from focusing on just collecting more money and start asking the question, how do we optimally use the money that we have? So in my mind, that, that is a core part of the structural reforms that is required. Uh, but having said that, there are a few other things that need to happen outside of you know, the core government-driven mandate. And this is around um, investments from the private sector and from the development sector, where we there's need to look at health as an investable asset class that is worth of private capital. And here we're looking at you know, from our work, we've you know fundraised for health interventions and access programs, and we've built investment cases to say that okay, from a purely you know financial and social perspective, can we demonstrate what is the return for every dollar we put into health, whether it's at community level, primary dollars for every one dollar that is put in, and that becomes important because now you can you can really present the health case not just in terms of lives saved, but in terms of the economic impact. And you know, talk to people in treasury or impact investors to say, okay, you know what, for every dollar you put in, you get about $10 back. And there are very few other investments where you get that kind of return. And therefore we need to bring in a lot more money um, into health. And so um, I want to pause there. I think in brief, that is what I see as a key structural reform that are required. And I think we are happy to take questions and see areas where we can support that process. Thanks and back to you, Bruce. Well, thank you so very much, um, Dr. Rono. And, and once again, thanks, thanks so much for coming in despite your very busy schedule today in Kigali. I just, I mean, for, for many of us, I have to admit as, as public health professionals, we have more of a, a focused uh, kind of concentration at lower levels of the conversation. So it's really enlightening to hear um, your, your review of the bigger picture revenue collection kinds of risk pooling and the, the, the purchasing functions. And it's really also important. I think we, 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 we have indeed all, all too often focused on achievements in, in, in terms of uh, outcome indicators that, that don't take return on investment as, as clearly as, as they need to. I think some our advocacy will really need to, to demonstrate that. And you're giving us some, some excellent examples. This is also a, another good segue to our next speaker, um, Dr. Miriam Ahmed Aliu, who's, a, who's a, a team lead at Kaduna State Contributory Health Management Authority in Nigeria. So here we're gonna do a little bit deeper dive into some of the uh, investments, sustained in investment kinds of issues that, that were being discussed, going right down to Kaduna in Nigeria. <clears throat> and building on the presentation, we realized that you know, financial barriers to primary health care are, are really actually going to remain one of, the, one of the most difficult barriers to overcome on the path towards achieving universal health coverage. And our question for you then, Dr. Miriam, is as an authority, 
committed to the attainment of UHC in Kaduna State specifically in Nigeria? What efforts has your agency put on the ground to ensure provision of sustainable, quality, and affordable healthcare services with financial risk protection? And how have you ensured the linkages between private health engagement, private health facilities, to expand service coverage? So with that question in mind, Dr. Miriam, I turn over to you. Sorry, um, I think you might be on mute. Yes. I'm having problem with my video actually. It's functional, but let's, uh, it's, it's a rather okay. unique presentation. <laughs> I think we can yes. hear you loud and clear. Exactly, it, I'm having problem here with my own video. I can't, I'm not seeing you. And uh, there is something I want to share with you. With you. Actually, our authority has made a lot of efforts in making and in, in, in providing access to primary care to the residents of the states. As a new authority, I would have loved to share um, um, a presentation with uh, with you to to make to give some highlights of uh, how the authority started and when it started so that we'll see the effort made within these um, two years of our, of our, of our of implementation of our scheme. So- well, Dr. Dr. Miriam, it does look like maybe there's a bit of a challenge with sharing screens. And um, if you just, uh, given the time that we have, if you wanna go ahead and talk through that. Meanwhile, uh, our colleagues in, in the background here might, might see if they can assist, but let's, let's go ahead and uh, talk through what you had on your screen, thanks. Yes, sir. I'm having problem going back to my screen. Okay. Okay. Sorry for the for the delay. Um, actually, um, Kachma, which is Kaduna State Contributory Health Management Authority, was established February 2018 as one of the human capital development protection strategy for all the residents in the state. The scheme aims to reduce out-of-pocket spending on health care to the barest minimum, thereby reducing poverty arising from catastrophic and impoverishing health spending. The, the scheme is a social security system for all residents and has been carefully designed such that the rich subsidize for the poor, the healthy subsidize for the sick, while the young subsidize for the old, inconsistent with traditional African solidarity and in line with the overarching global agenda of attaining universal health coverage. The authority commends provision of healthcare services, uh, service delivery to a release since June 2020. The vision of the authority is a commitment to attainment of universal health coverage, while our mission is to provide access to sustainable quality, affordable healthcare services with financial risk protection to the residents of the states. Our core value is integrity, professionalism, accountability, customer focus and efficiency. The, uh, the main mandate of the, of, the, of, the, of the scheme or of the authority is to ensure effective implementation of the policies and procedures of the scheme, issuing appropriate regulations and guidelines as approved by the board to maintain the viability of the scheme, carrying out public awareness and education to the rest of the scheme to the residents and coordinating and establishing quality assurance of the services provided by the stakeholders. Access to care. From inception till date, our authority has accredited a total of 412 healthcare facilities 
and all these facilities are being empaneled across all the three I mean, across the three geopolitical zones, and that is the 23 local government areas in the states. Out of this, we have 24 public secondary healthcare facilities, 273 public primary healthcare facilities, 19 private secondary health care facilities, and 96 private primary facilities. So efforts have been made to ensure equity and access to service by providing at least one healthcare facility per ward, particularly for the primary services. Enrollment, we have, in total, we have a roll 510,961 500 enrollees. So by now in Kaduna State, we have a total coverage of 10% of Kaduna state population. If we put together the, um, the other health uh, insurance schemes in the state. Utilization of services, services and enrollees have access primary and secondary healthcare services, over 378 enrollees, over 378,000 and, 20, and, and 22 are released, that is 73.9% of the total people enrolled have accessed care. And uh, quarterly quality assurance exercise is being carried out along with the relevant stakeholders in the delivery of the uh, service to ensure quality of care is provided to all the enrollees. However, we have uh, we have some strategies as in, in because um, the scheme is a new scheme in the state, so we have some strategies to improve uh, the informal sector er enrollment because we know that in every in, in any health insurance scheme, the informal sector is the main is the major backbone for the for the maintenance and sustainability of any health insurance scheme. So we have continuous sensitization advocacy activities to create more awareness to residents of the states, is of of payment to improve coverage. So we have uh, introduced um, <coughs> micro payment through e-wallet to allow flexible premium payments by informal sector to the scheme. We also made it so flexible that uh, even um, the farmers can even pay with, with farm produce. And the development of Kachima domestic resource mobilization policy document is thus in, 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 in line with that. We also have improved, we have improved a, a robust plan for resource domestic mobilization for health financing through religious and community organizations to chip in so that this will help us in, in, in making the scheme to become more uh, acceptable to the, uh, to the um, residents of the state. And uh, in order to make sure that the services rendered are qualitative, we introduce on schedule monitoring and evaluation activities to accredited healthcare um, providers to improve quality of healthcare services. However, despite um, all these, the main challenges are we have insecurity in some communities affecting sensitization and access to healthcare services. There is inadequate funding low awareness about the scheme by the residents. Even though the scheme was made, the law that um, made the scheme made it mandatory on all the residents, there is lack of enforcement of the mandatory aspect of the scheme. And uh, other challenges include poverty, religious, and cultural barriers to the uptake of the scheme. There is incomplete access to some services in the benefit package due to limited infrastructure, equipment, and human resources in some healthcare facilities 
uh, especially in the rural areas. And there is also poor referral linkages in these areas. So these are the main challenges that the authority is facing. However, we have some, uh, some form of strength that there is strong government um, and political will. The, the state is funding the vulnerable population by giving 1% of the consolidated revenue fund. And we have strong collaborative effort with partners supporting funding some of the, with partner support by funding some of the interventions like HIV and tuberculosis. We also have strong collaboration with private healthcare providers as many of our healthcare providers in the urban settings um, are, are private health, um, health facilities. So we have um, regular on the job staff capacity building and problem solving during periodic interactive sessions and quarterly quality assurance visit to the healthcare facilities that have significantly improved their um, and that has actually significantly improved their service provision. So this is actually how far we have gone. Thank you. In, pro in providing access for primary healthcare services, especially to the in, in to make sure that um, all the three geographical areas in the state are being covered despite the challenges that is what we as we have we are we have actually achieved by now well thank you very very much uh dr miriam that's that's really a, i think it's a it's a it's a perfect um uh step down from the the larger picture that dr rona was presenting straight into a very hands-on statewide effort in nigeria and, and i'm really pleased to see the government commitment and and um, and engagement and and you've worked through many of the nitty gritty elements of this particular intervention i think the, the the obvious question that we would all love to hear you respond to given if we have enough time and we'll come to the questions and answers shortly would be what about expansion moving from one state to 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 a nationwide effort and is there a vision for that and and collaboration between states in nigeria so many lessons learned and thanks for sharing that we're going to move on now Thank you. To, um, and, and maybe talking a little bit about government engagement uh, onto the issue of accountability. And we're, we're very pleased to have with us um, Margaret Luvala. She's the executive uh, director of the Health NGOs Network. It's, it's uh, known as HENET. Um, and just to frame the question for you, for you, Margaret, uh, and, and, and recognizing uh, the humanitarian and climate crises, the pandemic that have made virtually every single country's journey towards um, um, universal health coverage challenging. It's really now time for leaders to take action. We can't just talk about political will. We need to see political will demonstrated. And part of that whole issue is the role that civil society and NGO partners play in holding our, our, our national leaders accountable. So my question for you, Margaret, uh, today is how do you see, can you be specific on the role of CSOs in, in coordinating activities of, of all the different partners? So we do come with one strong voice um, uh, and drawing on your experience, your, your, your very impressive experience in Kenya and how you're working to ensure that there is really a structural accountability mechanism around the UHC commitments that, that Kenya has made. Also I'd like to add, how you're using the platform to engage leaders specifically for the forthcoming, for the year in front of us and, and leading up to the General Assembly. And yet another, I think, a very pivotal moment in history when, when every, every uh, government around the world will renew its commitments to universal health coverage. So we're very pleased to have you as our, our last of um, six panelists. And, and Margaret, I, I turn the floor over to you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um... Uh, I just want to, you know, give a brief introduction to Hennet. As you have said, Health NGOs Network uh, is a membership network of 105 organizations, and, and membership to Hennet is by organization. And so we bring in the strength of 105 organizations dealing with all areas uh, within the spectrum of health. Uh, we, we exist to 
promote civil society roles and engagement to transform Kenya's health sector. I think in terms of um, the CSO role in achieving universal health, one of the things that you know we need to say is that uh, the Ministry of Health through the Division of Primary Health Care has recognized that primary health care is the engine to universal health coverage. And so after the pilot, there was about seven pilots in seven counties. Uh, some of the challenges led to the, uh, to the development of what is being called the hub and spoke model, where you have um, uh, the level four, a higher level facility, you know, providing support to the spokes and the spokes being the lower level facilities and the community. And so when I talk about the CSO role, I'll be talking about the primary health care uh, um, model that is being rolled out by government. Now, in terms of the role of CSOs, I think one of the things that goes without saying is that CSOs are not just, you know, uh, there to demand accountability, but CSOs are also service delivery uh, uh, organizations. Uh, in this country, there are about 13% that are actually providing health and a larger percentage that is in the communities uh, in the 47 counties of this country. And so, you know, the, the role of CSOs, you know, cannot be underrated because not, not only do they sensitize communities on PHC, on UHC and other emerging health issues, they are sometimes the first responders together with community. When we have pandemics uh, such as the COVID-19, uh, while a government is rolling out policies, uh, CSOs are busy trying to figure out how the policy will relate to implementation on the ground. And so whilst addressing social determinants, building community strengthening systems and so on and so forth, including innovations. And so I think the role of CSOs is secure in terms of achieving universal health uh, in coming in as a strong partner to government uh, to be able to advocate for rights-based uh, programming because for us, it's not just about health, it's not just about financing, but it's also about the quality. Uh, it's also about leaving no one behind, uh, including the most vulnerable, marginalized, and minority group that exists in this country as enshrined in our constitution. And so in terms of your second question about the role of HENET in ensuring accountability, uh, one of the things that uh, HENET did uh, uh, once the president announced that this was one of his big four agenda, the UHC, of course, after all the global and regional activities and, and, and the agendas that had been rolled out uh, in terms of UHC, uh, Henry developed a UHC position paper uh, that was disseminated uh, to the health uh, CSOs and submitted to, to the Ministry of Health. And in that position paper, one of the commitments we made as CSOs is our commitment towards, you know, pulling our weight uh, in UHC, but also raising some of the concerns uh, that we had and making some recommendations. And I will not go to it right now in case you want to know the paper is available and I can also answer a question or two. The other thing that we are doing uh, in UHC is that we are, we are building the capacity the first thing we realized is that um, we are all talking UHC, PHC, uh, but the, a good majority of CSOs do not understand what we are talking about, what UHC really portends for them, uh, whether what they are doing is UHC related or not, whether it is PHC or not. And so uh, a, a big chunk of, of, of time has gone towards capacity building of CSOs for them to be able to speak intelligently and uh, to the topic uh, at hand, and also to be able to advocate you know, with the right knowledge. Uh, we've also encouraged enrollment of citizens into the National Health Insurance Fund and other prepayment insurance schemes. And we are a co-convener of a country multi-stakeholder platform uh, to build accountability for health by government and this is co-chair is chaired by ministry of health 
uh, with uh, with uh, Hennet as the secretary and co-convener. Now, uh, I just want to give you examples of some of the things that uh, Hennet has been able to do or is doing uh, in terms of uh, engaging leadership. Uh, and I realize I don't have time, so I'm really skimming through. Uh, I will pick three things that we have done, three areas, PHC. Uh, one of the things that we did with the support of funding from PAI is to undertake, undertake a budget analysis of PHC in four counties. Now, the first challenge we encountered is that uh, there, is no, there is no set a percentage for PHC. And so what we did, you know, we could only work for one year because we don't know what led to the percentage allocation of that year. And so that is the first challenge that we brought to the attention of leadership. And, and to be more specific, the National Health and the National Assembly Health Committee. And so with the findings of the budget analysis, we were able to have uh, di high level dialogues with the National Assembly um, Health Committee and the Senate Health Committees. Uh, you know, the, the organs that, that would support us in government, in parliament and in Senate. And so we also are developing indicators to aid in the development of a PHC scorecard in 2023, because we realized that, you know, there could be a scorecard by government, but as CSOs, we want to put in the scorecard what is really hurting, because the government, you know, is doing a lot and may come and say, we are doing one, two, three, but as CSOs, we are looking at the indicators that will help us to fast track the move towards uh, UHC. Uh, we are also members of CISEM. Uh, we are members of a co-group in CISEM, under CISEM rather, and uh, that is the civil society engagement mechanism. And we have we are rolling out a four-year uh, research on social participation and how that looks like in terms of UHC and what are the models that would encourage citizen participation in in in. Uh, matters to do with their health, to be able to speak and to advocate, uh, building their agency and their voice uh, in terms of UHC. Uh, we have also presented a memo uh, to the Director General of the Ministry of Health uh, on, on, the, on, the, on PHC based on the findings of our study on the budget analysis on PHC for four counties. Uh, yeah, so finally, looking at the reproductive health, just quickly, uh, the government launched an investment framework which expired in 2016. As CSOs, we realized that it was gender blind. And so we have such as CSOs and build capacity of CSOs. And now we have indicators that we, have, we are giving uh, to the Ministry of Health in by way of a memo to ensure that indicators, gender indicators, are included in the next reinvestment framework because just because it's a reproductive health um, framework does not naturally make it gender sensitive. And so that is one of the things we are doing. And I know I've run out of time, Bruce, so <laughs> I'll stop there and I think allow for more questions. But um, yeah, I could also share the presentation. It's quite, it's a presentation that I could share if given the opportunity. So thank you very much. Uh, I will stop there. Okay, Margaret, thank you so very much. And I, I think across our six panelists, we're very, very pleased to, to end on, on this issue of civil society's engagement. Essentially, this is who all of us are, um, very keen to see how we can advocate for true accountability and engagement of our, 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 our national leaders. And you've given us an excellent example from, from Kenya, also down to a deeper dive on specific thematic areas of engagement. And of course, we love to see the focus on sexual reproductive health and rights as, as a key element of, uh, of universal mm. health, health coverage. So I thank you very much. And could I just encourage you and indeed all panelists to go ahead and put in the chat uh, any presentation that you feel um, our, our colleagues would, uh, would benefit from because I, I know um, there's a wealth of information around the table today and, and we should share what we, what we do have available. Now it is time for us to have a, a, a little, um, unfortunately a, a little, um, period of questions and answers. So the floor is open. If somebody wants to, to uh, raise their hand, they can. But I'm, I'm going to start with um, 
a, a question that uh, Mark asked, which is very specifically, how is um, UHC responding to vulnerable individuals and people living uh, in rural regions when the country is still not in a stable space, most likely when there's political instability, ethnic uh, conflict, drought and hunger, and most of the communities are not responding to the services available at that time. Um, and that, that uh, I, I, I believe, um, you know, who could we direct that question to? I think because of the, per, you know, but could, could, could I direct that question to Dr. Aisha? And really looking at the, the instability caused by the, the climate challenges that you've been facing mm -hmm. over the last uh, last months. Yes. Over to you, Aisha. Um, yes, it is it is quite a challenging um, area, reaching out to youth in, in marginal, in uh, areas where there is a lot of instability. I think there are many mechanisms by which we can reach out to them and address them. I don't think there's any perfect solution and I don't think anybody has really got it exactly right that this is how we use. But but there are a mix of ways that, um, I mean, we Pathfinder have reached out to certain areas and I know within my experience well, how the government has reached out to certain areas. And that includes working directly through their own service providers and particularly through the um, the community health workers that they have within, within the distal areas. Having said that, there are certain areas where there is uh, there they, there's no coverage of the community health workers, and that's where the government really likes to work through community-based organizations. And Pathfinder has also worked with community-based organizations that actually go out and reach out to more directly in these conflict areas. And working in these conflict areas, we have to engage with our security agencies, with our you know law enforcement agencies to ensure that there is a safe access of services and we are clear to um, access the youth over there. And that's really the core way of how we work within these distal communities. I think you cannot have a good universal health coverage when there is still conflict going on in the country and there is still instability in those areas whether it is through man-made or natural disasters. But you can engage with the local governments as well as with the community-based organizations and leaders within those communities to actually provide some level of services until the wider stability is addressed. And, and in order to seek and, and provide inputs in ensuring the wider stability, there are multiple level of organizations that you can advocate with and uh, work through. So the partners within this whole conversation include our development international partners, as well as our law enforcement agencies, our politicians, and that's where the advocacy for allowing access to uh, those areas and providing services to the youth in those areas uh, becomes important. I know Thank this you. is not a perfect answer, but um, this is the best that's been happening on the ground. Well, I, and, and indeed, there is no perfect answer for any one of these questions. I think we're all learning as, as we go along, and I thank you for that. And, and it is this kind of practical, um, we get our hands dirty and we respond as we go along in an iterative process where we're always learning. And it's it, mm -hmm. truly what such uh, webinars uh, offer an opportunity for, for such exchange. So I thank you, Aisha, for that. Mm -hmm. I'm looking through the... Um, the questions, uh, and I think there there have uh, been some individual responses um, to by by panelists to some of the questions asked. Just, and I don't see anybody's um, hands up at the moment. We are more or less on time. Just uh, just give one more minute if anybody did want to raise their hand and ask a question. All right. Um, Okay, well, what I, I certainly would like to give a, a huge uh, vote of thanks to, to our, our six panelists. Maboub, uh, fantastic you could join us from uh, Bangladesh. And, and Kareen, it's always, always nice to, to have the voice of young people represented. Uh, Dr. Aisha, Pakistan, and, and again, uh, our, our hearts are with all of you there who are still coming out of the terribly um, uh, impactful flooding. Dr. Uh, Rono, I know he's now back into his, his, his meeting in, in Kigali. Dr. Miriam, thanks so much for the deeper dive that you provided uh, for us in, in Nigeria. And, and uh, certainly last but not least, least Margaret, the, the perspectives that you offer on the critical importance of civil society 
<laughs> leading the charge to hold account uh, governments accountable for, for the fundamental human rights of universal health coverage. I'm gonna turn over now um, to my colleague, Pamela, just to summarize and, uh, and wrap up. And, and once again, huge appreciation to, to all of our panelists. Over to you, Pamela. Thank you so much, uh, Bruce. Uh, thank you all for those amazing insights um, on uh, primary health care. I took away several uh, thoughts. The first is the importance of the digital space and the need to embrace technology um, to further discussions in the health space and to do so and to do to move with speed. Primary health care needs to be addressed in multiple settings, ju not just the urban, but also the nomadic, the rural, and the whole area of women-led climate resilience or population health and environment or population environment and development, whichever name that you give it, is becoming critical with the advent of the challenges that the world is facing um, with climate change. The healthcare system clearly needs to be listened to and the demand side for healthcare also at the same time. We have a push for the six WH, WHO pillars, but you know what, there's that seventh one, the community-centered healthcare, and that came through in several of the presentations. Looking at the community level, we have community health volunteers versus community health workers, and we need to think critically about um, going forward, the issues around compensation for these needs to be something going forward that we all look towards. The role of CSOs, uh, Margaret from the Health NGOs Network in Kenya spoke about it, but the importance of civil society organizations and the innovations that they bring um, and the importance of being people-centered and then also looking at UHC and PHC, making sure that communities have access to care without suffering adverse financial implications. And then the whole important area of uh, talking about uh, the financing. And Dr. Rono eloquently spoke about governments needing to uh, adopt an attitude of looking at UHC, first of all, as a right to health. But secondly, he also talked about thinking about UHC in terms of health financing, revenue collection, uh, risk pooling, and strategic purchasing. And uh, the other thing that I think has come out clearly is the importance of coverage for marginalized or minorities. So looking at the older persons, persons with disabilities, for example, persons living positively with HIV and AIDS, adolescents and young people, and then including strategic diseases. So HIV, malaria, TB as part of the basic, basic package. And then those public-private partnerships, the state and non-state partners working with civil societies, to ensure seamless service delivery, particularly during emergencies. So there were very many amazing ideas. The budget analysis of primary health care in, in different parts of countries, developing indicators so that we have a PhD scorecard, um, making sure that we are aligned with um, the CSM, the civil society engagement mechanisms, um, across our countries, but also a recognition of the many challenges that came out clearly from the Kaduna State presentation, insecurity, inadequate funding, low community awareness, poverty, um, uh, issues raised by religion and faith, uh, and all of that. So, but the importance of strong government and political will are critical. I can see I'm running out of time. I did want to say and give a vote of thanks to Dr. Mebratu Masebo, to the moderator, Bruce Campbell, to Dr. Aisha, Dr. Mariam, 
Kareen, Dr. Margaret Lubale, Dr. Rono, our Chief Strategic Engagement Officer, Crystal Lander, all of our partners at the heart of UHC, Hennet, Kaduna State Health Management Authority in Nigeria, ENK Consulting Kenya, SOSJD Burkina Faso, and all the participants that joined in. On behalf of Pathfinder International, CEO, the President for uh, Africa, and all those participating, we wish you a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thank you and have a lovely rest of your day. Good morning and good night as the case may be. Good evening.